Okay, okay guys. Let's start. In times like these, being a citizen is a big job. Thank you for joining us to celebrate the virtues of self-rule and debate the state of our republic. Welcome to the Citizen's Prerogative Podcast. This is the voice of your nerdy host, Michael Biscatelli, and we are blessed with a co-host whose passion for our republic proceeds him wherever he goes, Raymond Wong Jr. Hello, it feels like just yesterday. (laughs) Uh, Maybe a matter of minutes. This is episode 13 in season two, and we are still talking about the Freedom Contract. So let's call this Freedom Contract Part 2. Last time we were with you, we were talking about, we we had reintroduced the car metaphor. Um, We had talked a little bit about the current state of the Freedom Contract, its imbalances, irregularities, issues. Um, And then we started introducing some planks to this platform around freedoms, right? This idea that our system provides us the capability to implement freedom across the board for for citizens here to be free from oppression to be free from poverty and to be free from ignorance and there's a lot to that and it's something we really need to do if we want to invest in the republic and make make it democratic really democratic and give everyone a fair shot to participate in their democracy critical so where we left things when we were last talking about these planks we were talking about freedom from oppression and we had covered a lot of introductory statements uh, around some of the ideas that roll up underneath freedom from oppression so we just want to wrap up that discussion um, meander around it a little bit more maybe shut it down and then move on to the other freedoms from poverty and from ignorance, we may end up in a three-part series. We'll see. (laughs) Ray and I are trying to do something a little bit different now that we're free from laying out the foundational work. We're trying to get a little bit more casual or a little bit more relaxed in the structure of things, Um, be a little bit more, you know, loose, conversational. And I think things will get a little bit funnier over time. Hang on because it's about to get wild. Now, I I think going back to just the freedom from oppression is that, you know, I know we're moving on to freedom from from poverty, but I think that freedom from oppression, like we spoke about in the last episode is great, but it's very idealistic if you don't have the means. The pay to play situation with our government system, uh, the way we've all been raised really makes freedom from oppression impossible we almost don't have the physical means uh to do it individually um but collectivism is going to be really important that's kind of where citizens prerogative comes in right so this is the first time we're taking a discussion across three episodes because it's it's too it's too advanced to try to oversimplify right we're not going to fit it into a 360 degree episode no no, and in, even within these topics, we're, and thanks for bringing that up. I mean, we're, we're specifically going to drill into maybe what we think is most critical. Um, you know, the, the red lights are, are flashing. And um, <laughs> what's been laid bare, I mean, over the last X number of years now in our lifetimes, so much has been laid bare to be seen, you know, for those who are willing to see it. You know, you have to be willing to let in the information, what is, you know, all of the facts that are available so you can possibly formulate what the truth is. Unlike some people who are narrowly being fed, you know, through some tube somewhere and they have no interest in diversifying their diet. So um, with that being said, you know, if you're listening to us, you're probably into at least listening to things (laughs) from a broader perspective. Um, But Oppression, really, we've seen it now, the lack of equal justice being applied. I mean, fresh in our memories is Capitol Hill still. So we clearly saw how the police can operate. And it looked very different than how we've seen them operate with other 
protests. It's just ridiculous. It really is. And and I hate to say that it makes perfect sense. And it's so good to just see it so plain and so bare so that people can stop pretending it's not true that we didn't fight a civil war, that we didn't have slavery. I mean, <laughs> and we didn't have the Holocaust. All of those things happened. And we are still living with the effects or ramifications of it. And I think the fact that those people marched on Capitol Hill is evidence in and of itself that that's true. So I don't need to belabor it. But what was really nice and heartening to see, and I think is the right path, again, people's actions need to match their words. Right now, the words are starting to sound real sweet, real spot on. But that's, in the past, been part of the rigging, say one thing and do another. So let's see. But we've got Merrick Garland, right, introduced um, as going to be the successor for leading the Justice Department. And they said all the right things. I mean, it, I, it was really heartening and wonderful to hear them remind us how the Justice Department was born. It was born basically to combat the KKK. More to the point, it was created and established to protect all of our most recently newly elected Black representatives in Congress as they transited between Washington, D.C. and their homes among the states in the South because it was dangerous. The KKK was an insurgent, subversive organization, and it was stalking and taking out government representatives of the people early on in its inception. The Justice Department was established as a part of Reconstruction to help fight that, to counter that. Our members of Congress should be protected. They are the representatives of the people. And it's, you know, having... Having William Barr and even before that, Jeff Sessions, I hope was the pinnacle of perversion for the Justice Department's mission to have people like that at the head of it. So I'm going to step off my soapbox, but you know, in the space of equal justice, it's really important for us to understand the purpose and the and and the original, you know, standing up of a lot of our institutions. Um, because they're here for a reason. It's for better or worse that we will use the capital as a continual demonstration because at least for it's a, like for our podcast, you know, Mike and I have talked, spoken about it. We are not interested in talking about propaganda. We're just talking about history and what has happened. We're not current events. Uh, it was actually a conscious thought, uh, when the capital fell, uh, Michael and I thought about, because we were supposed to record, I believe, that night or the night after, mm -hmm. and there was a conscious decision to say, let's wait and look at what the country looks like in a few days, because we didn't know. We, we, there was that uncertainty, um, but what this is is a clear example of oppression gone out of control, oppression pushing down to the point where it became a powder keg and no matter how you frame it those individuals are suffering from oppression it's the same system that we're all being manipulated by theirs just got out of sync they were just in a different system that was bedded in lies instead of ours which is bedded in the acceptable lies so at least michael and most of us listening to this podcast are rooted in the acceptable lie system hmm. i mean we <laughs> At least it's fact-based um, yes. for the most part. Yeah, humans will lie. But when you start believing lies, it, it, there's no end to it, right? It's hard enough to maintain a system when everybody agrees on facts. And when when something's not true and it's obvious and proven that we agree. And without that, it's just, it's an, it's pandemonium. It's this. This is, <laughs> this is what happens because... <laughs> I don't know if I don't know how many of those people really knew why they were there. No, they didn't. Not when they got in as well. They didn't look like it. I think my uh, uh, partner said that they looked like tourists. He thought they were just very confused tourists walking through 
because they just they didn't look like they really knew why or how or why they were in there, but they had already done it. <laughs> so it was just like keep 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 going with it sort of thing. So I, I, I think I it's was, a, I was terrified because I had Julius Caesar in the back of my mind and I was like, oh, so everybody who would have, you know, taken over the government in place of Trump is in that building right now that's under siege. That's real interesting, right? Um, Pence, Pelosi, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> it would have been one of who would have been. It would have been DeVos or something. You know, I'm, that's assuming something happened to Trump. But this idea that you know you've got this this dictator who wants to resolve his power, and all he needs to do is take care of this group of people. <laughs> and you just... had a joint session of Congress, and everything's aligned appropriately, and. Yeah, it's, I it's couldn't believe it. I was like, why would they leave themselves so nakedly exposed like that? Just it, 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 it was a fantastic set of events. And I, I am really looking forward to seeing all the root cause come out. Not, you know, all how, how it was allowed, how it was perpetrated. So much, so much, but freedom from oppression, I think, and, and trying to like, get through wrapping this one up. I feel like mm -hmm. Michael is everybody's problem. We're all experiencing a different version of the oppression. I don't care if you make a lot of money or a little money, everybody's facing it. And even, even our billionaires, they're probably um, within their own gilded cages, afraid of what will happen and being told by the other people in power if that you, you can't let others have any of the money because if we let the people have the power, we'll lose our money. I, who knows what the conversations are like, but I would imagine that everybody is being oppressed in their own way right now. Yeah. Yeah, the inequalities baked into this system right now, the contract is shredded. It's just a mess for everybody. And, and, you know, like you said, even if you're rich, you're probably living in fear more than anything because you have everything to lose. Why don't we just squeeze in a message from our sponsor, Citizen Do Good. Fulfilling a dream where all possess an intrinsic love for self-rule that's reciprocated with free speech and equal justice under the law citizen do good values all of the amendments of the constitution along with the original core documents it is the framework and operating manual for our republic and it provides us the means to change with time time is now overdue to deeply re-examine our current implementation of governance for the dawning of our next age we are a proud sponsor of the citizens prerogative podcast a major partner in spreading the good word about civic love and the power of change for us all. Help us stay on mission and grow this community by rating the podcast five stars in your app. If you don't feel like you can give us five stars, let us know why on our sponsor's Facebook page, Citizen Do Good. Like the page to help out even further while you're there. Please also join our newsletter at citizendogood.com. You'll get every couple of months uh, a set of updates on all of our antics and not just the podcast while you're there also check out the shop uh, not only can you pick up some merchandise you can also help just contribute to our projects you can add a contribution to your cart when you're checking out please feel free to share any suggestions you have directly through our contact us page that's at citizendogood.com thanks for your support so with that, Ray, let's talk about freedom from poverty. And it's, it's, I think this is going to be fun because we've been talking about it already quite a bit. So we get to freewheel it a little bit, maybe sell it a little bit, uh, I don't know, a little bit better than we have in the past, um, attack it from some different perspectives. So when we're talking about freedom from poverty, we are what it looks like on the ground materially for us is that it's creating an equal footing and a real opportunity. I would call it the great reset, right? How wonderful would it be if everyone showed up to play the game of Monopoly and we all played by the same rules? Not only did we play by the same rules, the rules were set up to make the game fun, enjoyable, engaging, replayable. Because at the end of every game, I guess there's only one winner or there's somebody at the top and some people at the bottom. Hopefully the people at the bottom can still eat. But 
it's still a game, right? At the end, you put all the money back in the bank, you start from zero, and you come back to the game, and you get to play again, and it's replayable, and you never ever necessarily always know what's going to happen. Wouldn't it be amazing if we lived in a system that provided us the same opportunity to be curious, to explore, to engage, an equal footing, and a real opportunity? Dare I, I say, what the, going off of the Monopoly analogy that you uh, said that uh, there's a universal basic income in Monopoly. Uh, every time you pass go, you get $200. I, I didn't thought. even think of it. You're right. <laughs> I thought there's universal basic income. So I just want to say thank you, Michael. You're absolutely right. Monopoly gives you a good analogy of a fair, a fair shot. Yep. And the version of the game we all play to get today is... Uh, you know, is set up and structured very much like the study was done in, in um, Berkeley. Not everybody got the same amount of money. Not everybody got the same base to start from. And in our system, that's an inheritance. In our system, that's being born to the right parents. In our system, it's so many ways that well, somebody... Right market move. The right market move. <laughs> the right market move. <laughs> You may have known something you shouldn't have known. And now senator. you're playing a certain senator. Hmm. Well, not any, well, short, soon won't be, right? We'll see. Um, yeah, I, I love, and so with the car, Monopolies, there's a, I love that there's also a car in the Monopoly game. So <laughs> we'll see how we play with these two metaphors, but um, they're so spot on. And, and going along with that whole idea of like having an equal set of rules, we, we need to have fair, well-regulated, and fiduciary-managed markets, markets, financial services, things that are really intended to be utilities. You know, we can create businesses out of those things that generate plenty of wealth or, or income <clears throat> for many, many people. And it doesn't mean that they have to cut corners. They don't have to be a PG&E for the sake of profit. Um, I think PG&E is a great example of what happens <laughs> when something only has another example of like a utility that only has a profit motive like banks. It can be very dangerous, but it's really a utility. It's just, it's there to offer a set of services um, to facilitate our lives. I thought it was really interesting. You bring up PG&E and uh, I know they keep shutting off power lines to protect the public, right? They, they keep shutting off the power lines in the wilderness. And it's interesting because we've got, we, we have um, APS here in Arizona. And it, it's interesting to see how we deal with that matter because around the APS lines, there are huge clearings that are maintained annually between all the power uh, controls. So uh, we just have a much different approach um, but it's because of heavy regulation. Okay, APS did not do it out of the kindness of their heart. Arizona has an acute issue with fire. So we were very interested in strict controls. And in turn, APS has these, I, I mean, you just, it looks like, it, it, I almost had to ask once when I went to an APS line in the forest, I said, do, do the trees not grow here because the power? And, you know, the person, of course, told me no, that it's just that there's a strict con a strict um, adherence to annual uh, maintenance. And of course, that's controlled and regulated. So there's this partnership between these private companies and the government that that is necessary and, and, and can be done because we're not shutting anything off in Arizona, where I'd imagine it's more prone to fire, right? Do these power line issues and such. Um, mm -hmm. But again, profits over people um, that has to be regulated. But what happened? Where did California is one of the most heavily regulated states? What happened with PG&E? Oh, um, that was an experiment in utility deregulation. Oh, in California. Yeah, this is an artifact of uh, major moves in, I believe, the 80s and early 90s to deregulate and, um, you know, open up markets for energy companies. And so there dollars went to profits like they were cashing out of the company without reinvesting in um, the infrastructure and they knew the infrastructure is huge California's huge it's a lot of lines to maintain 
well, then you should have been setting aside more money for maintenance, right? That that's that's the logical conclusion. But when you know that the state of California is going to bail you out or whatnot, potentially, or your or your rate payers are just going to bear the cost, you might as well just take your paycheck today. Why am I going to reinvest it in the utility? At the same time, they just assume the climate would stay the same. Not like some of the other utilities, like the petroleum companies and stuff that have researched it so heavily and are preparing for climate change ahead of everyone else. But this utility company really didn't um, pay much attention to all of our forests drying out during these droughts. So these trees didn't even used to ignite like they, they do now. The climate has changed quite dramatically. I've seen it in the 12 years that I've lived here. If we had been running, if PG&E had been run well, the challenge they would have to overcome is the change to the climate, not having to rebuild the entire utility grid because it's all fallen apart. It's dilapidated. So um, the true cost of operation, the true cost of manufacturing, I mean, I think a lot of this goes back to, well, if you want to run these things for profit, then we need to make sure we're regulating them well and we're baking in the true cost of these products. Right. Fair, well-regulated. And we, we're, you know, we say that the markets in general, like if it impacts our livelihood, it's time to make very clear decisions. We know what our utilities, we know what are necessary for us to exist and what's basic rights, which is access to clean water and electricity, that is that is now a basic right. And that's the kind of things, you know, the internet will get there hopefully one day, but for now we need these two basic things, electricity and water in the United States. And not even, not every, even everyone has that. So again, fair, well-regulated markets and that equal footing to two points that, you know, we've, are, we've already made. Yeah. Yeah. And these, if you think about it from a national perspective, okay. And this kills me because there's all these nationalists, this idea of nationalism out there. And it's really just some perverted um, political point of view. If you care about this nation, then you care about its infrastructure. Everything about our lives that is modern is hinged on electrical power. And it is the oldest, most fragile, most backward piece of technology we have implemented coast to coast. I mean, you think you got potholes on your freeways. Yeah, that's nothing compared to the really sad state of our system. And other countries have newer systems than ours. We haven't reinvested. We haven't rebuilt. We haven't done anything because everybody has just been bleeding this thing dry, right? Right. I mean, it's not just the citizens of this country that, you know, what, what is it, the 99% or the 98% or the rest of the country that are suffering from deterioration. It's our physical country <laughs> that's suffering from deterioration. Guess who's not deteriorated? Ray, you made it a good point earlier. Um, Congress is well-preserved or has been. And um, wealthy people. No good reason. No good reason. In any case. Well, other other than control. There is one reason. It's not a good reason, you're right. But the reason, and people need to be very wise, wise to this, is that the longer we are in poverty and the longer that they can keep a majority of us below the poverty line or within uh, within a paycheck of poverty, they, they, they're just, we have no time to mm. be free no time to be intellectually free and no time to be fair. No time. Yeah. And they woke up, the system was already there. It was already in operation and they had a choice. Well, (laughs) let's just keep it going. (laughs) This is going to work out really good for me. Yeah. It's like, it's Alice in Wonderland. I'm going to use that as my analogy. We're not, you know, we're not the government. We're not any, we're the rabbit. We're the one who's running late. And we're the one that's panicked and we're late, we're late, we're always running late. So the rabbit was too busy to deal with anything in Alice in Wonderland. And I feel like that's the American people. We're running late. We don't have time. We've got to take care of this. We don't have time. We have to make money. We don't have time. We can't do this. We can't take care of the environment. We don't have time. So we're the white rabbit and everyone else is out there pulling the strings in this madness, this American nightmare. 
the other piece of this, you know, we're we're talking about the for profit, the utilities, and and healthcare honestly ends up being a utility at the end of the day, um, as well, because none of yep. us know how and when and in what ways we're going to need to use it. Just like electricity, right? You you pay for electricity regardless of what you're using it for. Healthcare should be the same way, right? It's a utility. It's available. There's a price. We all pay to participate, to have a, to have this utility. Pricing is the argument. How is it priced? Who pays the price? That's the big deal. Um, but it needs to be available to everyone. And there's so many ways to solve that problem and so many ways to solve it today that move us towards a better future, to a better solution in the future. Um, but we need to get to the point where it's not healthcare for the sake of profit. It's healthcare for the sake of people, different P it's. And again, when we say for the sake of profit, it's like, well, (laughs) do we rebuy shares of our stock or do we give a higher dividend or do we reduce the price of a medication that we know 90% 90% of America is dependent on because because the other board I sit on of McDonald's is feeding everyone food that's making them require this diabetes medication. So you start to see, you know, the connectedness of some of these things and how how the sickness and the keep you alive just enough in the right ways for the sake of profit emerges in this loosely organized economic system that we have. I mean, Make no mistake, our economic system is organized. It's just not organized around like a Soviet um, party of 20 people. It's maybe 1,200 people, but it's connected. They're connected. Those decisions aren't made in a vacuum. They all sit on each other's boards for a reason. They're all connected. They went to university together. They went to Ivy League schools together. And they all have the information and they're, they're sharing and they're, there is a motivation there. And so that's the challenge is that as long as we are, again, fighting over scraps, essentially, uh, that's, that's a purposeful methodology. So if we can be freed from poverty and freed from the worry about health care, right? If you, could, if you could quit your job tomorrow and know that there was still a safety net for you, how many of you would stay at your job? If you ask yourself that question right now, um, if we ask you to do a deep thought of freedom, would you stay at your job tomorrow if you could have a, a meaningful, uh, valuable, basic income? And, and, and we're not saying that that is the only essence of freedom. What we're saying, it's a mechanism of freedom that we fully endorse. Um, because freedom from poverty for other individuals will equal freedom for everyone. It will raise the base. Right now, the base is literally a base. Like you can just die on the streets in America. But if if you will not die on the streets in America anymore, if that's not the fear and everyone can finally lean into a greater good, that's kind of what we're looking for. So freedom has never been experienced. We've all never experienced true freedom in this country yet. Mm -mm. Because because poverty drags us down. If you're not living in poverty, the base is still dragging us all down right now through taxation and through social programming and through policing and through police systems that are dealing with through mental health, through imprisonment rather than treatment, right? So we are just totally backwards. We're creating criminals and then punishing them. It's almost like a monster that eats its own excrement. Because it has vitamin C. We have poop sifting and poop eating now. Season two. Sifting was season one. Go back. Go back to psilocybin. <laughs> ah, we're full of shit. Um, you know, it, it just, it really does boggle the mind when you take a step back and think, well, you know, Chances are, if we if you redesign things, just like if you redesign the human body, we would design it differently. You look at the system and how it's become rigged and you know shifted and warped to help maintain the status quo. Um, we need to get in there and we need to start shifting and warping and adjusting, readjusting the status quo back to something that's 
more supportive of our mutually, you know, our mutual right to pursue happiness. Um, all of us who were born here, regardless of your circumstance, because now, that, now that's... Michael, if I'm worried about feeding my family, if, if when I wake up in the morning and I have to drive to my essential worker role, and I mean I have to worry about feeding my family, feeding, you know, keeping their their health insurance, and goodness, mm-hmm. if any of them get sick, it's a new year, right? So everyone in America right now is facing a new deductible threshold. Yeah, yay, along with the new year, right? That's right. And, and more people than ever are going to, could benefit from mental health from, from something, you know, having some, some line. I was looking at, um, there's a few of them out there, um, like Talkspace and there's another one, not to advertise anything, but they're all, they all look like they're, you know, 250 to $300 a month. And some of them, you don't even get to talk to somebody face to face, like through an app. You, you, some of it's just text based, um, but some of them you pay a similar fee per month, and you get like one or two so many minute appointments, and then maybe unlimited access. That's just like wow. That's like that's a car payment, isn't it? Yeah. I well, mean, that... I mean, you got good interest rate. I mean, if you got a good interest rate, it would say a used car. It's a used car payment. I mean, that's a car. It's a car payment for a lot of people. But yeah. you know, <laughs> I can't think of a time when people are going to be more in need of something like this because of a collective crisis we're experiencing. Not only because of pandemic, but because of the constitutional crises we've been living through day after day after day. It's just, uh, and, our, and then in our own personal lives, I mean, those who are experiencing deaths from COVID and, and like you're saying, you know, people who are unemployed can't make ends meet. But yet we use these phones as a kind of, we, we were kind of get lost in these worlds uh, within social media, right? It's, a, it's an outlet. It kind of replaces the town hall because that's now the new argument, right? Is that freedom is social media and that freedom is, is, is this is your accessibility but that's mm. the issue though is no you can't lock people in a room and put them on a phone but that's what i think everyone kind of is okay with the general pop um as far as the government's concerned we need to be investing in the town square like build me a town square so i can go speak at it for goodness sake that's the problem People yeah. are trying to say that the, that social media is the new town square, but no, the f- problem is that poverty, we've, we've, we've focused on the people with poverty. So, I'm sorry, the people with probably that need it the most, right? The public parks, the public facilities, the public utilities, the people that need it the most, they, they were the, the ones that utilize it. We're limiting, we're limiting it. Because we're saying, well, we don't need that town square anymore. We don't need these gathering points. We don't need parks and yeah, such yeah. because not everybody has equal access to the internet, these apps, these phones. Should they? Is that how we want to interact? We want it, we want that intermediary. How how do I know what I sent was what was received? But it's the, very peculiar. But this is the freedom of oppression. Michael, right? Like we talked about in the last episode is that we don't really have a choice right now. We're all marching kind of there. We we have an, we have an impression of choice right now, but there's only a few, like you said, 1200 people pulling the strings right now. We are all puppeted right now. There is not a genuine choice going on. There is a battle and we're all kind of having to make our choice of a, you know, the two sides of the coin, if you will your Android or your Google, you know, your, your I'm sorry, your Android or your Apple. Um, but just like when you were IBM, you know, PC or you were Apple, there's all this choice to be made and life should not be about simple black and white choices. Well, and you get overwhelmed with it too. I mean, at the end of the day, your life is local to you. I mean, it's immediately local to you. And the things that impact your life the most are the next most local thing to you, right? Right outside your door. Why do you need an app to engage in the things that are affecting what's right outside your door? You don't. Our system is not designed to require an app for that. Our system 
is, you know, designed from the local level up, 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 you know, layer by layer so that us as a community can have a way to self-govern on a local level. And it's critical. It's critical that we find a way to start engaging in that again, because now you're right. We're, we're just to take a step back. Okay. So poverty is preventing people from having access to some of these things. Well, let's be clear. These things are not protected by free speech either. So right now there's this big rumbling going on because of all of the silly things that are happening in these technology spaces by these people and these technology companies that really aren't representative of societies as a whole anyway, but they have these outside, you know, outsized control and influence on them. And it's just so strange in and of itself. But set that aside, the idea that your First Amendment free speech right is is associated with some technology platform is a little bit twisted. Your right to free speech is your ability to go out, you know, outside, go outside your house, go on a podcast, you know, get get your voice out there however you can. You don't have a right to be on a podcast. You don't have a right to be on an app. You do have a right to go to the public square. You do have the right to petition your government representatives. You do have a right to speak freely against the government and against policies and things that you don't agree with. Um, that is the right to protest. That's a very important part of free speech for your freedom, to maintain your freedoms, to make sure the boundary of your freedoms are being protected and maintained and known. Not through an app, necessarily. And and I don't agree with people getting kicked off these apps. I mean, one of the things that's really scary is when you, I mean, you can send things underground, um, but if it's like Demolition Man and, and now you've created a blind spot for yourself, you sent all these people underground and now they're going to rise up and overthrow you, that's not smart. That doesn't make any sense whatsoever, you know, and that's that's a risk that's going to happen when you start creating even more cultivated ecosystems, echo chambers, right? By now excluding certain people. Now, I I understand why it's happening. I I don't necessarily disagree with the motivation. And I also don't disagree with people being banned for some period of time because I do believe in the idea of consequence, right? Action, consequence, and reaction. Yeah. So, you know, you violate some terms, you, you know, you violate the rules, we all agree to the rules, then then the punishment needs to be applied equally to whoever that is. I don't care who you are. But a permanent ban, I think, becomes problematic just because now you're creating blind spots. But I think what's even more sinister or a bigger issue baked into this is the concept that people think that these platforms are an effective form of free speech that these are somehow associated with first amendment rights it's like the the ignorance i'm going to say is getting layered and baked in here and you know i'm not saying that people couldn't bring lawsuits or whatnot yeah i'm sure a lot of this stuff can be litigated through the courts what is free speech what isn't what what apps do or don't have responsibilities to it but Ultimately, none of these apps, it's not their responsibility to be our objectors to our government. You know, they were just supposedly creating opportunities for us to choose to connect to one another. But when you live in a physical community, you don't always get a choice on who you're going to connect with. And that's why we do, Ray, I totally agree. We need those public squares. We need to create even if it needs to be virtual like a virtual physical whatever we need to have going forward it should be something specifically for that purpose Mm -hmm. there was a well we've already spoken about it small business getting back to local control um there was this big obsession with automation and centralization etc and it's really been detrimental to our uh, system of government and to even our people. So now we don't even talk to our neighbors, right? So technology uh, worked so hard to be 
our primary method of communication that it accidentally pushed out everyone, uh, um, even your neighbor, right? Because if they don't subscribe to the same phone service or same social media platform, you're not going to connect with that neighbor, et cetera, et cetera. So we've really lost something without that town square. And because of the town square, so something happens, I feel like, Michael, when, when people get their freedom right now through the current system from poverty, when people get their freedom from poverty, we do something, and I like to call it the earbuds. You used to talk about it, people walking through the city with their earbuds in and they just yeah. ignore everything. And I feel like that's what happens. Like you, you reach this level and you put your earbuds in and you stop going to the town square because you don't have to, because you don't have to be bothered, right? Yeah. You don't have to be bothered by the vagrants or you don't have to be bothered by the homeless. And it's a, it becomes a problem to you that you kind of shut out um and i think that's the that's that's the challenge is that right now when people free themselves from the the current poverty system they then put in their ear pods they close their and they close their eyes and they travel through life ignoring um those that are still stuck in that poverty cycle mm -hmm. yeah it's a travesty um you know, and you hear it, you, you hear that spoken about in other communities, like, well, you know, you made it out. I mean, I feel like that in a lot of ways for yeah. myself in my own life, right? I, I made it out of a condition I was in. I elevated my caste mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in my lifetime, right? frankly. How, I, think that's I mean, true. is it permanent? I don't, <laughs> it's not permanent. Nothing is, nothing is. Well, and I think that's part of it. We all have motivations we all have drives and 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 my partner tells me i'm obsessed with it you know like i can't live on any floor lower than the top floor i have to be on the top floor and there's all these things we do that that we we do to set up or achieve our, our position in life right um but something happens at a point where you achieve that 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 ability right i now have the ability to live on the top floor which has a premium cost etc but again what am i doing after that am i Mm -hmm. Am I um, do and, and I think we talked about this in the last episode. I in no w way do I look at this and say I deserve this. It's mine. <laughs> you know, I, I say I'm lucky to have it. I appreciate it, and I also have to understand the others who are disadvantaged, the people that are outside of my window, the homeless, and you have to do something to give back. And that's why it's not fair. How much money do I give the federal government? I give them enough that they should be able to provide people a little bit of money every month so that I, I know that they're taken care of. So homelessness can finally be a choice. Yeah. Yeah. It's a it, yeah. It's a, right. It's a totally protest. A choice. Yeah. It's a protest. It's an ideal, right? So, wow, you're homeless. Good on you, man. Instead of right now, people say it's a choice because you don't want to deal with it. And thankfully you don't have to, because you can go yell on Facebook about all those irresponsible homeless people, you know, and you've never met one of them. Have you? Cause you don't go to the city. You mm. stay in your suburbs. There is no town square in Phoenix for you to go to. You stay in the suburbs. And ladder works both ways. It is shoots and ladders. So, you know, I, it's hard because a lot of people will look at homeless people or people with drug addiction and stuff like that and just somehow think that they're different. Somehow that's just different. They don't, they don't see the humanity in recognizing that that, you know, that person's in a bad place, but that doesn't mean that's where they've always been, nor does it mean they always have to be there. Um, just as much as maybe you're in an exalted position right now or you're feeling very comfortable um, and it doesn't always need to stay that way. Like when you interview, when you listen to interviews of people who, who are homeless over and over again, you know, they weren't always homeless. <laughs> Our system allows that to happen, allows people to get into those conditions for by umpteen number of ways. There are an unlimited number of ways to become impoverished and to become homeless there are very few ways to get rich, relatively speaking. I mean, not not the way the system is set up. So, in any case, I you know we'll, we're 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 going to keep continuing to make the case for this, and over time, keep introducing some more solutions. So, talking about that, um, 
in the past, we've talked about the fact that scarcity is a model. Scarcity is a model. It's not reality. It's a, a story more than or a myth than anything because if we need money, it can be printed. Mm. And you can't do anything with it anyway other than transact. So at the end of the day, it's a matter of just structuring the system. People get hung up on redistribution. Well, guess what? We don't need redistribution. We don't need redistribution. All we need to do is set up the rules correctly, set up the distribution correctly. Pass, go, get 200. What do you look like? Get 200. What do you smell like? Get 200. What religion are you? Get 200. <laughs> I, who cares? You get 200. You get 200. You get 200. That's yeah. it. That's it. You know, and... And it, and it works. It works because guess what? That money is going to get spent. What happens when the money gets spent? It goes into the economy. What happens when it goes into the economy? It creates jobs. It's, it, it is a system for a reason and it works for a reason. And, and some people just love greed. They just, they get hooked on greed. They get hooked on greed. I don't think we're even solutioning that we take away the greed, right? I think no. what's nice about you, you and I, and the, the overindulgence, direction overindulgence. Is we, <laughs> we're willing to meet you halfway. We understand this is going to take years and years and years and years to resolve this, but we're going to take the money. I mean, we're not going to take any money. It's just the system will adjust itself, right? Yes. <laughs> and if the system set up properly, yes. when you pass, just like when the Carnegie's or the, the Vanderbilt's, whomever passed and they left their homes and their properties and their estates to endowments and to charitable causes, you know, there'll be a structure, you know, you can die with all your money. It's just not going to be attractive to leave everything to Chauncey. Yeah. Yeah. And we have to decide like, as a people, we can say what, you know, what, what is felt rich what does it feel what, at what we've science has already started doing this and I'm sorry, I'm not speaking very clearly, but <laughs> how much money do you need to have or, you know, have control of to, to be able to make transactions with <laughs> having money is a myth, but to control, how much money do you have to control to feel wealthy, to feel poor, to feel middle-class, to feel rich, to whatever the tiers are. And they're starting to map out the dollars because Literally, I mean, we are animals. <laughs> we are animals. So we really can only perceive so much value to a certain point with money beyond which we just don't even, it doesn't exist to us. And so much money right now in the world is in that place that just does not exist to the people who have control of it. It is ridiculous. And so if we're just saying if simply there was a system set up so that Everybody, you know, you, you play the game, you want to be, you want to play the role of the rich guy. Great. Here's your opportunity. This is how it works. Here's how much you'll get relative to everyone else, which is a higher amount. And above that, it goes back to the system. We've done it before in this country. Well, that I was the old. That was, was the Eisenhower, old I think. Yeah. Didn't he? 90 over some amount, 90 or hundred percent was taxed. And it worked really well to turn around the things we needed to turn around. It was, it was pretty good. It was temporary, obviously. And I love competitive tax policies. Are you kidding me? You know, if, if everyone, in, if, if Ireland only wants to charge a flat corporate tax of 19%, then America is going to charge flat corporate tax 19% in my world. Okay. We're going to go toe to toe. Whoever's out there, we don't need to go below the line. We can be at the line because after all, it's still America. I mean, it's still kind of a fun place to be and have a company. So we match some of the lowest tax rates within reason. If somebody's at zero, forget them. That's something else. That's like oil money rigging in another way. But we need to remain competitive. We want assets. We want resources to re remain in the, com in the country. We want companies to stay here. So we should have tax policies that encourage companies to stay here. So we're generating revenue here that we can tax, right? But you don't give them loopholes. You don't give them socialism. It's for making sure people aren't sick and dying and homeless and hungry and, and are rather busy toiling, creating the cutting edge of the newest technologies of the, of the latest knowledge of the finding the, the next living organism in our solar system. Magic. And that's happening in the United States. 
that would be phenomenal. And then all the brightest and greatest minds in the world look at the United States again. And they're like, well, you know, all I really want to do is go study this arcane thing. I'm going to go there. I'm going to immigrate. I'm going to join that system. That's what we need. We don't need people who are in power for the sake of them to have their power. We, we are all joining in this idea of the union of the Republic to play by these rules and be free. Uh, and we are proposing a new way uh, a, away from this, this um, for lack of a better word, net that we've all been captured in uh, for, for generations. And we've accepted it because it's been here for generations and we think it's gotten better. But just because things are better than they used to be, just because we don't have child labor anymore doesn't mean it's better. And just because some people have health insurance now doesn't make it better. And the fact that some companies that are allowed to pay their employees below the poverty line, and it's just some companies, a percentage of companies doesn't make it better. We are asking for freedom from poverty, which means everybody is free. Yeah, you're going to hear us probably talk a lot more about plasticity and whatnot, but this idea that we adapt to the environment we're in is a blessing and a curse. So many of us went out and started working in a job thinking 90 days, two years, three years. I'm working in this job for this period of time to accomplish this thing, which isn't to continue working in the job. It's to do something else. And so then we become complacent or we become adjusted or adapted to that. And then 20 years go by or, you know, we use that to break out of a mold and like force ourselves into an uncomfort uncomfortable place because that's that's where we need to be that's where we need to be moving in that direction right at all times um and i think you know we have to be careful we've gotten comfortable with the few compromises we've achieved and we've lost a lot of ground yeah ray's having some technical difficulties i think it's a good place for us to wrap it for more information on this and other episodes, head over to citizendogood.com and click on podcast. While you're there, register to log in and leave a comment. We'd love to hear from the community. We've been your hosts. Thank you to Mr. Raymond Wong Jr. And thank you, Mr. Piscatelli. It's truly been enlightening. It's been something, that's for sure. And special thanks to you, our listeners. We save the best for last. You are the best and have been for years. Thank you for your support. We know it's painful and we love you. Intro music sampled from OK Class by Ozzy Jocks under a Creative Commons license through freemusicarchive.org. Other music provided royalty-free through Fizzling Studios, Inc. <laughs>